then I start the um, recording. And uh, please, Josef. Yes. Thank you everyone for joining and listening to me today when I will talk about my PhD project, Safe and Ice for Bridges Using Renewable uh, Thermal Energy Sources. And I will talk about some of the uh, work that we have been doing inside of our project so far, and a little bit about what we're going to do in the future as well. And to start with a basic uh, concept of our project is that we will uh, uh, try to use renewable thermal, or, uh, thermal energy in order to melt ice on roads. However, we're not going to do this everywhere. We're just going to do this on the critical parts of the road infrastructure, like in steep slopes, in bridges that are prone to have frost formation that are more dangerous and uses more um, transport work to, to, uh, to do winter maintenance on. Uh, so we're, we're going to use the pavement surface uh, as an asphalt solar collector to harvest the solar energy, store that energy uh, in uh, into the winter, and then uh, retrieve it and heat up the pavement surface. So it's a quite simple, basic concept. Uh, however, we, this gets very complex when we put everything together. And my aims are so far to be to study the feasibility of using these uh, hydronic payments in combination with a seasonal energy storage in the Scandinavian. Uh, climate. Uh, the people, let's see if this is working now. The people who are working the product are, are we, who could see here. It's me, Joseph. Uh, I have a background as an HVAC engineer from uh, from Chalmers and from Ramble, which is a consultant company, and there I was working with hydronic payment systems and um, realized that, okay, they are, the way we are designing them today is that we're using high temperatures and a lot of energy, and then we could melt snow and keep the, uh, the surfaces uh, free from snow. It's very effective. Uh, however, there is a very large energy consumption. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was this project started at Chalmers, and I joined it. Uh, and now I'm working together with uh, Bishan uh, and uh, Rob and Kolerik and Per in uh, this group where we're looking at uh, ice through roads. Uh, the presentation of today uh, is based on four columns here. Uh, actually, I would start with talking about the background uh, to explain why we are um, doing this. Then I will talk about the, my licensed thesis that I um, published uh, half a year ago. And that explains basically how we're going to work with these problems. And then in the end, I'll talk about what we've been doing with uh, developing numerical models and what we've been doing with building our test site up in Estesund. Um, and I hope that this will be of interest for, uh, for most of you, or some parts at least. So bear with me. So, uh, during the background, I will talk about frost formation, why uh, we have been focused on that, uh, talking about winter road maintenance and how we do it today, uh, the environmental concerns related to, uh, to winter road maintenance and uh, previous research made in this field. Um, so, have a look at this picture to the right here. Uh, it's reviews a road uh, where you could see that it's. Let's see if you see could get this pointer to work. Uh, do you see my pointer now? I don't see your pointer, but uh, you see the picture. Uh, and when, I, when I talk your way through it, uh, you can see over, uh, in the picture to the right here that you have uh, an area where you have uh, where it's dark and where it's bright. And in the brighter parts in the shoulder of the road, uh, there is visible frost on that part of the road. However, there is no visible frost on the black parts of the road. Which one is the most slippery here? And in fact, the most slippery part here is the part where, where you have no visible frost. Uh, and that is since the frost that has been forming on that part has been uh, reshaped and uh, the structure of that frost has changed into becoming slippery. Uh, and actually, there is no, uh, not that much knowledge in this field at the moment, but I hope that uh, the guys at NTNU and Alex group could do some research in this field to actually figure out how the frost formation, when it becomes slippery, um, in order to better understand this phenomenon. Uh, instead, we have been focused on, on the uh, conditions for forming uh, frost, since that we are very well, well aware of. Uh, since in order to have frost formation on a pavement surface, you need to have a 
uh, surface temperature that is less than the dew point temperature. And the dew point temperature, it's a measure about how much moisture there is in the, in the air. And you also need a surface temperature that should be below zero degrees. Then you can have frost formation. And depending on um, how uh, the amount of moisture, the dew point temperature in the air and, uh, and the surface temperature, you will have different amounts of moisture build up, different speeds of it. Uh, so uh, we, we would like to address this problem with frost formation of roads, since uh, this could easily be maintained by keeping the uh, surface temperature above the dew point temperature, then we could mitigate uh, frost formation. And this is one part of uh, why we do winter maintenance and uh, how uh, we keep our roads safe. And we are for uh, specifically uh, addressing frost formation. Uh, and we know that uh, uh, driving on uh, you know, during winter uh, has a lot of problems or encounters a lot of challenges. Uh, we have the problems with the accessibility of our road infrastructure, which leads to traffic jams and log logistical delays. And this leads to large financial costs, which are hard to, to put a number on. And there's been a lot of estimates on it, but it's, I mean, this is hard. And uh, the problems related to winter, main, uh, winter roads are also uh, to have increased uh, accident rates uh, during winter. And especially in areas where we have less winter, that is in rather areas with rather mild climates, we have a lot of shifts between uh, plus and minus degrees. And we've also found that those are the areas that are most suitable for having uh, hydronic payment systems uh, that we have been studying uh, since then we have uh, milder winters. And the picture to the right is uh, outside of campus here where we had a little bit of snow a couple of weeks ago and we have four three buses standing in a row here and blocking the traffic and it was problems all over Gothenburg. I guess we have a lot of experience some way or another. So the way we are tackling these uh, problems with uh, winter road conditions is that we do winter road maintenance. And uh, I guess most of you have experience from one way or another driving behind a winter maintenance trucks uh, or so. But the winter remains consi consist of three basic pillars. It's snow removal, de-icing, and anti-icing. And snow removal is when you mo uh, remove snow from a pavement surface by using um, a grader or a snowplow or a grader uh, and you also add a little bit of salt to it in order to to help plowing the snow away. Then you have de-icing where you remove the ice that has already bonded to the paved surface by spreading uh, a lot of salt or using uh, graders. And then we have anti-icing where you prevent ice formation on the pavement surface as a preventive measure. And then you spread uh, smaller amounts of salt, but you do this very often. In fact, anti-icing is the most commonly done winter maintenance procedure, uh, and which spreads the most part of the salt uh, in the Scandinavian countries today. And we're spreading a lot of salt. We're spreading more than 600,000 tons annually in Sweden, or in Scandinavia. Uh, and all this salt ends up in the environment. And there we have some environmental concerns. Uh, this salt leads to uh, saltifications of fresh waters, and the fresh water is what we are drinking. Uh, so we would really avoid to have uh, salt to drinking water. And if you have high amounts of salt in a lake, you could also have uh, stratification in that lake. That means that you have different layers uh, that is building up due to the different densities, and those layers um, prohibit the mixing of the water in this lake causing lack of oxygen in the bottom and dead bottoms, uh, which is a problem that is uh, very bad for those specific uh, lakes. And the spreading of um, salt also le leads to that the chloride ions uh, penetrate into the soil, and there the chloride ions uh, facilitates the leaching of heavy metals that could be contained in the soils. And that uh, leaching of heavy metals out in the drinking water is also a problem that has been seen. And then, of course, we have the problems with animals, uh, mostly aquatic animals uh, that could have problems with reproductions, and also that animals are attracted to roads causing accidents. 
Um, so there are a number of environmental concerns related to using salt, and some of the locations are extra sensitive, like uh, the areas where we take our drinking water. And in those uh, specific areas, we need to consider how using alternatives when the, there is risk that the uh, salt levels gets too high. And the, um, there have been proposed a lot of different alternatives, and using uh, thermal energy has been studied for a very long time. Uh, it has been studied uh, since 1948 here, uh, when the first system was built in Klamata Falls in, in, uh, in the US. Uh, and uh, this system uses a, sh a shallow geothermal energy source. So it basically have, they have access to very high, hot surface water, uh, and they extract it and pump it through the pipes in the, in the pavement and heat up it. Uh, heat up pavement. It works uh, very good. In fact, this system uh, was in operation until 2001, uh, when it was uh, refurbished uh, uh, and taken into action again. So it's still operational and it's been working as, uh, very good. Another very famous project here is the Cersei pro uh, project in, uh, in Switzerland. It was stored in 1994, uh, where we, they actually used, uh, harvested solar energy from the payment service, restored it and reused re re it in the winter. Uh, it has also been working rather well, however, it has been, it's not in operational anymore due to uh, some problems with the piping, as I understand it. Uh, common for all of those projects are that uh, they are using rather high uh, supply temperatures, above about 15 degrees, or that they are in areas where they have access to high ground temperatures. And if you have a ground temperature, uh, that is high, that means that it's easier to store energy in it since you have uh, smaller losses. And that makes a difference from our Scandinavian environment here, since we have uh, much lower ground temperatures. Uh, we are having temperatures in about, um, say, 4 to 8 degrees, uh, basically. And that is much lower uh, than the ones we, we, we're seeing here. Uh, so that is basically a challenge, but we need to design a system for a much harsher uh, boundary conditions uh, than the system has been, which has been used uh, previously. So to conclude uh, the background, uh, we know that there is an increased accident risk during uh, winter conditions, and the way we treat it is to do winter road maintenance and to decrease this risk. However, uh, there are environmental concerns uh, with the way we do traditional winter road maintenance. Uh, and a lot of alternatives has been developed. However, they're using high supply temperatures. And that is not a good combination with uh, using renewable energy sources. So therefore, we have been uh, trying to study on alternative. And in the licentiate, uh, we were studying this concept of hydronic payment and how it could be implemented. And we started the inter initial energy balance and uh, different storage technologies that could be suitable. Here we see our picture where we try to present the, the product in one single picture. And you could see that we have uh, the pipes that are embedded in the pavement here. Uh, which are traditional surface heating pipes, so hydronic pavement pipes, uh, buried a few centimeters uh, under the pavement surface. And through those, we could circulate the fluid. And the energy to this uh, fluid could come from local energy sources if they are available. However, in a rural area, that might not be the case. And then we are relying on the solar energy, uh, which heats up the pavement surface during the summer, heats up the fluid, we pump the fluid to a seasonal energy storage down here in the ground. We heat up the ground during the summer. We pump the heat back up during winter, heat up the pavement surface, and thereby we're mitigating the slippery conditions. And the reason we have been focusing on bridges is since bridges are more prone to have frost formation since they lack the thermal heat flux from the, uh, from the ground. And there is a constant heat flux from the ground uh, wow. Uh, which heats up uh, the road surface otherwise, and they, it's, this prevents frost formation. However, the bridge lacks uh, those, uh, those conditions. 
So you can see here that the road is has okay conditions. However, uh, the bridge is full of frost. And this is uh, the thing that we would like to try to avoid because in this case, we need to have a uh, truck spreading salt on this road. However, the rest of the road might, uh, network might be OK. So we're not focusing on removing snow from a pavement surface. Since if there would be snow on the road, uh, a pl uh, snow, um, snow plow, plow will go there and remove that snow. And that should also remove snow from the bridge. And that is. Uh, Quite severe, uh, quite limiting our energy need uh, quite much. So when we started the project, we started by doing an initial energy uh, estimation, and we found that um, based on a simplified Asher model and uh, uh, by uh, using uh, estimates from asphalt solar collector, we could see that we have more energy available. Uh, than which actually uh, needed uh, to keep our, our roads free, especially in the, if we are in a coastal climate like in those again, like Stavanger, Olesund, uh, Bergen, Kristiansand. However, if we move further inland in Östersund and in Jönköping in Sweden, we see that we have a much harsher climate and we don't have enough energy. Uh, However, for most of occasions that are related to the E39, we see that we have a positive iron balance. And with this positive iron balance, we continue to look at different storage technologies. And we ended up studying borehole thermal energy storages. Um, however, we were also considering different uh, storage technolo technologies like phase materials. However, they don't uh, compete that well since they are not technically mature yet, they have uh, problems with cost and heat transfer rates and so on. So we went with a traditional system based on uh, boral technology. And those borals are the same uh, that we are uh, using in domestic ground source heat pumps that is heating many homes in Sweden. Uh, and uh, it consists of a hole that you drill down into the ground, about 100-200 meters, and then you uh, put down a plastic pipe in it, and where in that one you're circulating a fluid. And this fluid uh, transfers heat from the ground around the borehole to the, to the fluid, um, depending on the season. Then. And in a storage, you cluster these boreholes uh, tightly together. So you, you put them uh, tied together and that means that you could heat up a core and maintain the heat inside of that core uh, and limiting your, your heat losses uh, from the system. And this is known technology, so we're combining the known technology of boral uh, from rainy stores with the technology from hydronic payments uh, and seeing if we could make this work with much lower temperatures than traditionally. Um, in the licentiate, uh, we used BridgeSim uh, as a software to, to study the interaction between the borehole storage and the, the road. And it was used to evaluate the SERSA project in Switzerland. Uh, and we made used this to uh, do a case study for uh, the Trana Bridge in Sweden. And when the Trana Bridge was selected since this was uh, a site where we had a major ac accident in 2013 with more than 80 vehicles involved. Uh, and this accident was caused by, by frost formation and, and heavy fog. And, and the location has also been um, suggested as a location where you could use a hydronic pavement system. Uh, so we studied um, uh, the system from, uh, from a storage perspective and we we compared two different storages, one in clay and one, one in granite and one in clay. And in the graph here, you could see uh, how the number of borals is affecting the system performance, DH fail here. And this is a number of how well the system is performing. And you could, and you could see that when you increase the borals, uh, you increase the system performance, which is expected. Uh, the system we're starting here is uh, 1,000 square meters and it's a boral depth of uh, 100 meters 
and border spacing of 2.9. And we have no groundwater uh, flow in this uh, area since if you have a groundwater flow, uh, flow, it's very hard to store energy. So you need to have good ground conditions for the system to work. If we study the surface temperatures we got from our model, we could see that the surface te temperature in the summer is warmer when you don't have a hydraulic payment, uh, and it's uh, warmer when you have a hydraulic payment in, summer, uh, in the winter. This is what we expected. Uh, you can see that there are rather low uh, surface temperatures, so it's not that high temperatures you actually could be, be harvesting, even though this is the mean temperatures. Uh, we have maximum temperatures of about 40, 50 degrees, if I remember correct. And if we then study uh, a, cold, uh, a cold period in February, and we could see that the surface temperatures with hydraulic payment is kept above zero for most of the time. However, when we have a cold spell here, spell here around the 9th of uh, February, uh, the temperature drops. And this is since the, we turn the control system turns the system off when you have very low air temperatures. And this is since um, when you have a low air temperature, uh, your, uh, the air can't contain as much moisture. Uh, and in order to conserve energy, then we turn the system off. Because with low uh, moisture content in the air, there is also a low risk for frost formation. And when the, the weather gets war warmer around here, we turn the system back on and we see that we. It comes warm. So this is a way of conserving energy. Um, and this, uh, okay, now it looks a little bit weird here. Uh, if we look at the, energy, the performance of the system, we could say, uh, look at how many hours you have different surface temperatures. And if we study the, the critical uh, surface temperatures, that is when you have uh, a uh, surface temperature below zero degree, and an air temperature above minus 40, then you have a lot of moisture in the air and you have a cold surface and have a high risk for frost formation. And then we have a quite large uh, reduction in the number of hours with those conditions. Uh, this number should say 91%. So it's a quite significant reduction on the slippery air. Uh, the risk for, for frost formation. And this comes as an energy cost of about 121 kilowatt hours uh, a square meter. However, we are harvesting uh, much more. Uh, and the energy we are extracting from the storage is about 115 square, uh, kilowatt hours a square meter. Um, and the difference in between this and this is the, the action uh, electric energy need from the pumps to, to move the fluid around. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, yeah it's performs very well. However, we believe that we could reduce this amount of energy that is actually needed by uh, incorporating the dew point in the control system and not only relying on the air temperature. So you remember the conditions for frost formation. That is that you have a surface temperature that is less than the dew point temperature, and at the same time having a surface temperature uh, that is below zero degrees. And if we add this parameter when we're evaluating the, the, the data, we see this. Uh, the red lines here are uh, the surface temperature for a heated system, uh, dashed one is for unheated, and the blue one is the dew point temperature. And for a heated case, we see that uh, the dew point temperature is always lower than the heated surface temperature. There is no risk for frost formation. However, this is also true when you have an unheated case uh, for most of the time. Uh, in, case, in fact, it is actually during the, this occasion and this occasion here that we have risk for frost formation on the road. That means that we are heating for most of the time with no no use, we we could actually not hit here and still have good road conditions. Uh, so when we consider this, uh, we see that we have only six hours with risk for frost formation uh, for for this case of transport compared to 400 hours without, and that is a very significant decrease of uh, the risk for for frost uh, for frost formation there by uh, slippery road conditions. 
Uh, so by this we could conclude that, okay, having a system that incorporates the two-point control into the control system uh, is very important to have. So uh, from this we could conclude um, that low temperature hydrogen payments reduce the risk for ice formation on critical parts of a road infrastructure. Uh, it suits location without the mild winters. It needs a control system that takes the dew-point control into account. And by this knowledge from the licentiate, we moved on to uh, develop a new numerical model, which also could import, incorporate a mass balance for the moisture flux. Um, and we did this by using the opening uh, open source programming language Python. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's similar to MATLAB, but it's free, you could basically say. So, so this will be available, uh, uh, more easily available afterwards. And uh, we'll talk about the problem description, the approach, and the result we've been using this problem, uh, part of the party. And the problem we're starting is actually how to simulate the fluid temperature uh, and the return temperature from a hydraulic payment system under varying boundary conditions. And where that is a problem since uh, we don't actually have such good uh, knowledge about the initial condition for a system, the boundary conditions that is affecting it, uh, and the material properties that might be changing uh, depending on moisture content and so on. So this is a very complex problem to, to model. And it also um, you know, incorporates a, a 3D domain uh, since we add um, since we add uh, the fluid in the pipe. Traditional uh, system that are used for uh, predicting road surface temperatures that could only work in 1D or 2D in order to study this problem. Uh, we need to work in 3D since we have the fluid domain as well. And uh, this figure here is from the test site taken this summer. Uh, and uh, here you could see the piping that goes into the, pa into the pavement. Uh, and I will talk more about that later. So uh, the remote uh, numerical method we're using is an explicit, explicit for differential method, uh, meaning that for each uh, time step, we are calculating a new temperature in our domain based on the previous temperature. Uh, and that is resulting from the heat fluxes between our calculation cells. Uh, this method is uh, rather good. Uh, it's uh, very stable as long as you uh, use rather short time step in your model. Uh, otherwise it could be uh, very unstable. But it's also very easy to implement and therefore one of the reasons that we chose it. Um, and it's based on the work that uh, uh, Andy Carlson made in 2010 here at the division when he was studying floor heating system. Uh, and we are calculating the, the temperature field in each of these seg segments here. And then we connect the segments by the fluid flow inside of the pipes. Uh, so the case we're studying is one that looks like this. One centrally uh, placed pipe inside an, you know, a pipe array uh, that is embedded in the, in the road. Uh, and um, the pavement surface is exposed to, to all the different physics that, uh, that goes on on a road surface. You have the convection from the air, uh, you have a heat transfer from the precipitation, uh, heat transfer from traffic, long wave radiation, and short wave radiation. Uh, evaporation, condensation, freeze and fall, and uh, so sublimation, deposition. All of these heat fluxes affect uh, the pavement surface. However, not all of them are as important. Uh, most important of them are the convection, uh, the short wave and long wave uh, radiation, uh, and the evaporation and condi uh, condensation. Uh, the traffic is also important, but mostly for the mass balance. Um, And if we look at the internal energy balance that we're using in the model, it's uh, based on the traditional uh, finite differential method. Uh, and we connect uh, each individual uh, calculation cell with uh, conductance. Uh, and by taking the temperature difference between the different cells and times the conductance, we get a heat flux. 
uh, and this heat flux we could use to calculate the new temperature of uh, the cell in the next time step. Uh, so it's a straightforward method we're using uh, and has been widely used. Uh, the problem uh, is when we're trying to incorporate the, the free part of a fluid domain. And here Henrik did a quite nice thing uh, where he used a local analytical solution. Uh, so we are calculating the temperature field for each of the segments. Uh, and then we say that uh, the fluid in the pipe are exposed to this uh, temperature field for the total length of each segment. Uh, and by doing that, we could use uh, an analytical solution that looks like this. Uh, but, uh, the exit temperature of the fluid is based on the inlet temperature and the surrounding temperature, and also on this constant, which is due to the length of the segment and the fluid flow and fluid properties. And by using this analytical solution, we could decrease the calculation times quite significant compared to using traditional FEM methods. Uh, and based on this temperature difference we, we could calculate here, uh, we, we have an energy flux which we inject into the 2D model of uh, the system. And uh, when we validated this model, we did it against a uh, meshing site on uh, E18, the highway E18 between Westeros and Enerschapping in Sweden, where we have measuring a lot of properties on the highway. And we see that we have a very good match uh, between the measured values and the calculated uh, values. Uh, and uh, the accuracy of this model is comparable with uh, what previously has been pre uh, presented by other researchers. Uh, so we are satisfied with that model working pretty well. However, when it comes to validation of the fluid temperatures, we, we have only done this against analytical solutions. Uh, and we can see that the accuracy is... Yeah, we're not sure about if this is working uh, as good as we're expecting. However, accuracy should be, be in this range above 1 to 2%, and that should be, uh, be good enough. However, to know exactly, we need to have a test site to, to verify, uh, verify this. Uh, so, conclusion from a numerical model is that um, we have made a model uh, which can predict the surface temperature very well. And the fluid temperature uh, needs further verifications, and therefore we have a need for a test for, uh, to set. And at the moment, we have a working paper that is in progress and hopefully soon will be submitted. So let's talk about this test site. You have seen some picture of it so far. What is it? So first I will talk about why we need a test site. Uh, we'll talk about the system layout and uh, the measuring system that we're using. So the test site we have developed, it's a, a Nord FV project, which is uh, run as a collaboration between the Statensvägväsen and the Trafikverket in Sweden and the Finnish road authorities. The whole, uh, part of this project, um, uh, and as I said, it's a node effort project, and it's built to study hydronic payments in a controlled environment uh, with a focus on power and energy demands, uh, and doing this in combination with a borehole thermal energy stores. And the reason we're building this is since this available system lacks enough measuring equipment, and we can't test different control systems there without having a risk for failure. Uh, or putting people at risk. Uh, so therefore we need a controlled environment to do this in. Uh, I don't know, don't know if every one of you have seen uh, the movie we have put up on YouTube uh, to present this, uh, this, this, this site. Uh, I have added the YouTube movie here. Uh, however, this movie will not start if you don't do anything. So I would ask you to listen up now and uh, click on this link to see the movie, because I can't start it for you. Uh, so click the link and watch the movie uh, to get an introduction of seeing what we have been building in, uh, in Östersund. So here we see the construction site uh, from this summer. 
before we started casting any concrete. And here we could see the main components of a system. We could see that we have boreholes, we have a, a service building, a heated surface, and our road webber st station. And I thank you, Albin, for making this movie. I don't know if you all saw the movie or not, but I hope you did. Otherwise, you could Google it, Google for Östersund and Halkfria Vägar, and you could see the movie there. The movie would have give you a better impression and understanding of uh, this sketch of, it, uh, of the test site. Um, you could, in this figure, you could see that we have a, a heated surface here. In the reference surface, we have a boreholes, uh, we have a service building and a web station. That's what we saw in the mode as well. Uh, at the moment, we are only construction uh, the surface one and two, and we are reserving uh, surface two as a uh, uh, something we could do in the future, uh, where we could test uh, how enhanced pavement materials uh, would uh, affect uh, the hydronic payment system if you could make it more efficient. Uh, the heated area we have in our system is about uh, 280 square meters. The pipe length is about 140 meters. It's designed to have a very low temperature drop of about 3 degrees, so that means rather high fluid speeds in the pipes. Uh, we don't have uh, such a big borehole uh, field here that we would like to have. However, we have four ones and we could use them to simulate the larger storage. Uh, and this is the system how it was uh, designed from the beginning. If we look at the pipe arrangement in the, uh, in the heated pavement, we have made to have uh, decided to use this shape of it. And that is in, in order to have as long pipe length as possible. It's not convenient to build in this way. However, by having long pipe lengths, we could um, have a larger temperature drop and actually have a measurable temperature drop. Uh, a real site would have a parallel flow, parallel pipe, uh, pipe arrangement uh, of a, a length of about 200 meters. So this is a tenth of a real section. We have put the pipes at a depth of 50 millimeters and uh, a pipe then distance of 50 millimeters as well, so they are very tightly spaced here. And we have three measuring sections in this um, in this road, here, here, and here. That means we could follow the temperature drop along the pipe. And we're following it by having a lot of temperature sensors embedded in the pavement here. And those sensors we could see in this figure here. To the right, uh, we have mounted this, uh, the temperature sensors, which are PT100 sensors. They are very stable uh, and durable to have in these conditions. Um, and we fasten them uh, at precise location. And the location could be seen in this drawing here. So we have two uh, for each, two surface sensors for each section, and then we have on the, on the pipe in between the pipes and under the pipes, and also measuring the subsoil temperature here as well. Uh, this picture here is from the measuring system, uh, where we actually could see uh, the real the measured values. We also have equipped our, our uh, test site with strain sensors to, to see check the movements of the pipes and uh, see if they are affected by future traffic loads. This is a per system uh, picture from uh, the, uh, the control system of a part of the system. Uh, here we can, it's a rather complex picture I know, uh, and I would like you to focus on some parts. So here you could see the pavement surface, which I talked about previously. Here we have the boreholes, and you could see that we could follow the, the temperatures uh, from the boreholes. Uh, so the fluid goes from the bore, uh, from the surface down into the boreholes and up and out again, and that is the ideal condition. However, we have a rather harsh climate here, so we have also added uh, this uh, electric boiler here. And the reason for an electric boiler is that uh, it was too expensive with having uh, a heat pump in this location, 
and so we are simulating uh, a heat pump by using an electric boiler uh, and we could be mixing water so it's a rather complex pipe system uh, and it's built for having maximum flexibility in this case and uh, you could remotely control uh, the flows in the system uh, the system for data collection uh, consists of a number of uh, systems. Uh, we have a, we are collecting information from a web system, which goes into a main computer. Uh, we're collecting data from the, the payment surface, which also goes into uh, the main computer. And then through this this uh, through this remote connection, I could sit at the university and look at the data and control the system. Uh, it's uh, an amazing system that they have been construction for us. Uh, and we have actually just gotten the system operational. Uh, this is some of the first readings that we have, where we have received. Uh, we can see that the system starts delivering data here. Uh, we have this is measuring on the, the outlet temperatures, uh, you know, we're in, uh, temperatures inside of a, a service building, and it increases here. And here I started mixing with with uh, the control settings, and it drops really quickly, and then it goes up. We also have measures from the payment surface, uh, and here we could see that uh, they are increasing. I mean, this is probably due to that we have a snow snowfall during this uh, occasion, which is insulating the payment surface. So we have a lot of exciting data coming in now. And uh, this is our uh, few pictures from when the system was starting to come alive. I don't know the exact uh, operating conditions here, but we could see that the pipe are going in this direction here. Since it's warmer here, it cools down and it starts to freeze. And we had uh, enough heat to keep this part almost ice free at least. Uh, so it's a really exciting uh, time now when everything starts to come alive here. So to conclude the test site, um, it's starting to come alive now. Uh, it has been a very long journey, starting uh, almost three years ago. Uh, and this winter we'll be use, using it to do adjustment on this system uh, to make it work as it uh, was intended. And then during the next winter, we will do real measurements and tests and have live data uh, to do uh, to compare our models with. And by that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I think I'm on time. Thank you very much. Yes, you are. Um, you, uh, we still have uh, some minutes left if you uh, if you have a. Uh more for it, but um, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Josef. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any questions from the listeners? I, I, I realized I forgot to say mention one thing here now, and before you, I can tell it while you're thinking about the questions. Uh, why do we actually need to build to measure? Uh, let's go back a little bit here. Uh, this part here. Why do we actually need to measure this part? Uh, that is since we could simulate this in the computer, we can sim simulate the temperature field around the pipes. And when we are measuring these temperatures, we could compare the measured values with the simulated one and could say, okay, our system is working or our model is working uh, when, we, when we look at this. Uh, so that's our, if we wouldn't have had those measurements, we we can't know if it's working uh, as we as good as we believe it, uh, it does. Yeah. So okay. yep. my name is uh, Chell Belsvik. <coughs> I work Hi. on the E39 project. Yes. And with the, especially with the bridge over Bjorn of Yeah. Um, I find this uh, investigations uh, very interesting. Yeah. And we also uh, uh, tried to build a bridge over the fjord on the west coast, which is not that uh, low temperatures as in uh, Stasund. Yeah, that's good. And uh, also we we need to build a um, steel box girder for the bridge. Yeah. This uh, box girder will be... Um, 
ventilated and uh, dehumidiated uh, throughout the lifetime. Yes. So a circulation in the in the bridge is necessary. Um, and uh, your investigation actually tells a lot about uh, the conditions uh, inside and outside the, the bridge it com when it comes to temperatures and and flow of uh, medium. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I just wonder what is what is necessary for this bridge to have uh, um, to have an ice-free surface through the few periods uh, in in winter time that is necessary, so that we don't have to add salt on the bridge and uh, may also reduce the um, risk of uh, corrosion in the steel yeah uh, so I'm, I, I don't know uh, uh, if we will initiate any activities around this but at least the uh, the way of storing energy and releasing energy and uh, put uh, more energy into the uh, uh, into the driving path uh, it's also possible on a bridge uh, and also, if we use the uh, stiffened, stiffener profiles that exist in the bridge deck, uh, it might be the same as for the pipes that you are indicating here. But they are, mm -hmm. they are built in the, in the structure already. Yeah. So we don't have to add extra pipes. The, uh, the lanes for uh, flow is uh, already there. Then it would be very interesting to, to see if it's possible to to, to combine this. Um, from the beginning, uh, we've been in, in this project. We've been focusing on short span traditional highway bridges, and there will be a lot of them uh, on along the E39. Uh, because when we started the discussions uh, regarding the long span bridges, there was a, a, a fear for added load on those structures and uh, having bringing a new system uh, on it as well. Uh, so therefore, we have not been focusing on, on, on those parts. However, it's uh, it's very much possible if you already have some kind of duct where you could transfer uh, a fluid uh, air or and preferably uh, some kind of antifreeze mixture uh, water, uh, then you could supply heat to, to this bridge. And it might uh, only be for limited, uh, for not that many hours during a season in, in a mild climate. Um, and it would be possible. However, um, the argument uh, regarding the risk for cor corrosion on the on this bridge and that uh, we need to reduce the salt usage due to that reason. Um, these bridges will be exposed to, to salty water from from the, the coast, I, I assume. And so, is, is it actually that much to be winning from from reducing the salt use in this case, uh, from, from that perspective? Yes, uh, maybe not. I don't know. Um, we use uh, a lot of salt on the roads uh, in yeah. the area, uh, but as you say, it is on uh, on sea, and uh, the the elevation is about uh, 15 meters above the sea level. Yeah. So the exposure of uh, salt is uh, significant. Yeah. Uh, I would say that um, the, the added salt from from the winter road maintenance in this case will not be uh, be such a um, big problem for corrosion. Uh, those problems you should do uh, solve with uh, with good uh, detailing work and uh, anti corrosion measures. Uh, in any case, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but you you will add a lot of fluid uh, into a bridge prep, but perhaps that will not be uh, such a big problem. I'm not a structural engineer in that case. Well, I think uh, fluids is not acceptable to add uh, to the bridge because, uh, as you said, it add the load is not um, um, it's not acceptable. Yeah. Mm. 
But then it would so, be interesting to study the possibility of, of using um, uh, if you have an open box girder with uh, with air in it, could that be heated up and insulated in, in a way to, to to transfer heat to the pavement surface? Yeah, that might be one crazy idea. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shadow. Uh, any other questions? If not, I, I have one, uh, Jonas. Uh, would you do any cost estimation of of, uh, of this? Uh, just just to have an idea of where where it should be uh, implemented uh, yeah. later on. Uh, at the moment, we that is not on our top priorities to, to okay. do this. Uh, we are focusing on making this system to work. Uh, however, there, there has been cost estimations uh, done on what it would cost to build a road or, or, or the added cost for uh, for adding this. Um, and though those are available in uh, our report uh, from Jan Sundberg, who is a uh, product leader for the test site in Östersund, okay. he has made a cost estimate. Uh, which is available on Traffic Arcade Samsung, and I could add a link to, to the presentation afterwards. Yeah, that was nice. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, everyone, thank you for your participation. Uh, we'll be back on this link uh, in one week, on uh, the 8th of December at 10 a.m. Then we will have uh, Jonas' colleague, uh, Rahab Mirsana Madi. If that was right, also with the topic uh, safe ice, safe and ice-free bridges using renewable thermal energy sources. <laughs> I, I think you two are uh, you are working together. Yes, yeah, we work together. Definitely looking forward to, uh, to listen to that uh, also. Thank you, everyone. Um, could you keep the line, Josef? Yes, I was down. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So this will be um, published on the Vimeo.